The Futility of American Protest by Dmitry Orlov Published, April 10, 2023 Recently, the most popular discussion thread on Reddit was Why Don't People in America Protest Like They Should? with 27,000 views and 5,000 comments. The commenters gave plenty of reasons for not protesting individually in spite of having every reason to do so. But what's missing is an overall appreciation for the fact that now all protest within both North America and the Western European Peninsula is altogether futile. There are some surface reasons. On the Western European Peninsula, the most obvious reason is that it's the wrong place to protest, since the entire place is now run from Washington and the local leaders are now mere placeholders, compliant and disposable. In turn, protest in Washington is futile because the visible public figures against whom one might protest are not the ones in charge, John Kennedy was none too eager to get into a full-on war in Vietnam and got shot, Bill Clinton was none too eager to bomb Yugoslavia into submission and got Lewinskied. The same goes for the Europeans, Dominique Strauss-Kahn had some independent-minded ideas about the Euro and got falsely accused and arrested for molesting a hotel maid, eventually, the case was dropped, but by then his reputation and his career were already ruined. And who is really in charge? Well, you deserve to be punished just for asking the question. Those who know, know. Those who don't, don't need to. It was over 40 years ago that I had the following realization, America is not a country, America is a country club. Membership has its privileges. Non-members get to pick up lost golf balls or serve martinis or give massages, they certainly don't get to tell the club management what to do. None of the reasons for not protesting given by the Reddit readers went as far as identifying the root cause, and I would like to fill that gap. At the time I graduated from an American high school some 40 years ago, a few of my Russian friends who graduated with me, thinking along the same lines, hitchhiked to Alaska, there to hunt, fish, and grow weed. Some didn't even bother graduating, since they had no intention of ever working within this sick joke of a social system. I remember one of them in particular, who dropped out, then tutored in algebra and trigonometry to those who hadn't. He had previously attended a Soviet school, making this dropout a professional mathematician in comparison to his American schooled peers. I stayed in Boston and we parted ways, but I too looked for a road less traveled, and eventually settled into being a public money sponge, getting paid by the government to measure anomalous one spin, look for proton decay, detect neutrinos from supernovas and other such pointless but amusing pursuits. I had several careers after that, but after some 20 years of gainful employment I definitely had enough, bought a sailboat, moved aboard with the wife, the cat, and, eventually, our son, sold the real estate and the car, and went sailing. That was fun for a while, as an interim solution, but the final solution was to move back to Russia. Thus, both for me and for my Russian schoolmates, the response to America, love it or leave it, was an unequivocal leave it, be it for US-occupied Russian Alaska, the 99-year lease on it expired back in 1966, or for Russia proper. The reasons given in the Reddit thread for Americans not wanting to protest are useful in that they show the degraded state of American everyday life, being simultaneously reasons to protest and reasons not to. But they do not present the root cause, which I will get to later. First, the reasons the Americans themselves give. Most people can barely make ends meet from paycheck to paycheck, and the system is structured in such a way that the loss of a job immediately leads to the loss of a place to live, health insurance, and, in general, being ejected from one's normal social milieu. Many people are forced to work more than one job or to put in overtime, while the work schedule in the US is designed in such a way that it saps a person's strength much more than a similar job in Europe or elsewhere. Many people face hour-long commutes to and from their jobs and have to drive themselves instead of napping or relaxing along the way. They usually get a single half-hour unpaid break for dinner. They have no ability to be absent from work for any reason, even to visit a doctor. 
Many jobs allow for zero sick days over the initial six-month probation period. There are no paid vacations and no paid maternity or paternity leave. Mothers can be fired for staying home to take care of their sick children. The list of such indignities seems endless, but people have no choice but to continue at their jobs, persisting in a state of permanent repressed rage that gradually eats away at their souls. People live in permanent stress over unpaid bills and worry that they might get sick and, as a result, go bankrupt and become homeless together with the family members that depend on them, but in spite of this have to maintain a professional, cheerful demeanor until the falsity of the situation permeates and poisons their psyche. The end result is that most people are simply too debilitated to go out and protest. These are all very good reasons to go out and protest, but there are equally excellent reasons to avoid protests. In addition to the futility of protest mentioned above, American police, which are armed and equipped better than some militaries, are a caste that is separate from the rest of American society. Policemen mostly socialize among themselves and have a marked us versus them mentality. Most of the time they can shoot to kill with impunity, but once in a while a George Floyd comes their way and causes one of them to land in jail for 22.5 years. They are supposed to catch criminals, which is difficult and dangerous, but then prosecutors can refuse to press charges, judges can release these criminals, and even the ones that are sentenced to actual jail time are released because the jails are overflowing. Such uncertainty is sure to fill them with rage against the entire world that lies outside their closed ranks. Even without such newly fabricated vicissitudes, they were never a well bunch, with very high rates of alcoholism, divorce, and suicide. Unleash mentally unstable police on a protest, even a perfectly peaceful one, and there is every chance of a few people ending up dead. Many Americans blame the police for the maimings, shootings, and disappearances of protest leaders. There is the unfunny joke that the chances of catching a bullet from the police, or of simply disappearing, increase exponentially with the amount of melatonin in one's skin, protesting while black is a very bad idea indeed. Those lucky enough to survive and get arrested may get sentenced to a jail term, and this can wreck someone's life from then on. Competent lawyers are about as affordable as space tourism, refusing to plead guilty to false charges and demanding a fair trial is often treated as if it were an additional offense, and judges have great latitude in channeling their inner demons. Those who are marginalized for protesting and are arrested and imprisoned are then cancelled. But you don't have to try very hard to be cancelled, the technology for cancelling someone in the US is very highly developed. Once cancelled, people no longer appear as part of society, and not just the individuals but their entire families. I have encountered this phenomenon myself without even trying, a few internet posts that challenge the groupthink were enough to shrink my job opportunities. What do my opinions have to do with improving the performance of some important widget? I asked. Well, was the answer, the investors might balk, and the board of directors doesn't like this sort of thing. And if you no longer look right to investors or directors, then colleagues start treating you as if you were a leper, your all-important network for finding good job leads dries up, and it's pretty much game over. These are all excellent reasons both to protest, who wants to live like a slave to the rich, and not to protest, who wants to suffer for nothing. But I believe that the root cause for Americans not protesting is something different altogether. The best way to prevent slaves from revolting is to convince them that they aren't slaves, and the best way to do that is to fill their minds with false hopes of someday becoming slave owners. This, in contemporary America, has been done with amazing efficacy and finesse. At the heart of the technique lies America's operative state cult, which is the cult of mammon. Inculcated from an early age through sayings such as there is no free lunch, the only free cheese is found in a mouse trap and money, that's all that's left at the end of the day and practices such as paying children to do their chores, money is positioned front and center. In America, everything, art and culture, religion, family life, even love, is soaked through and dripping with filthy lucre. 
In the 2000 Russian film Brother 2 the bitter truth about America is stated roughly as follows, in America, only money matters, everything else is a joke. Whereas in Russia a person's status depends on numerous factors, such as educational level, professional achievement, service to the country, popularity and respect, and even the number of children one has, the more the better, in America, with very few exceptions, status is much simpler and depends on a single factor, the number of digits in a person's net worth. John Steinbeck is often quoted as having written the following, I guess the trouble was that we didn't have any self-admitted proletarians. Everyone was a temporarily embarrassed capitalist. It's not that every American expects to get rich, it's that every American who doesn't get rich feels that he's been beaten fair and square and in accordance with the twisted, crooked rules people in America have to play by to get rich. There is an oft-repeated myth that America is the richest country on earth. However, if you look at the quality of the educational system, or the size of the prison population, or the prevalence of drug abuse and homicide, or child mortality, or the quality of railways or the prevalence and quality of public transit, or the state of the airports, or the quality of housing, or the level of homelessness, or the amount of dental care available to the population, it is a very poor country, much poorer than China or Russia, and not at all likely to ever catch up to them. It is, in fact, a poor country with lots of rich people. The rich people live apart from the rest, occupying stately homes in leafy, well-guarded neighborhoods, and it is telling that the wealthiest professions in America are those that cater to the needs of the rich people, the doctors keep the rich people alive and healthy and the lawyers keep them rich and out of jail. Since money and wealth are the source of every possible goodness and having lots of it automatically makes you a success and a winner, conversely, lack of money and wealth automatically makes you a loser. You may be a brilliant poet or philosopher, but since that doesn't make you rich, you are a loser, in accordance with popular sayings, such as, if you are so smart, why aren't you rich? And money talks and bullshit walks. Since, in the American justice system, Getting away with a crime is equivalent to not having committed it, those who attain wealth through criminal activities are judged to be at the same level with those who achieve it through education and intellectual achievement. The final ingredient in the puzzle, is that Americans are required to be competitive. Their entire lives leading up to their ultimate success or ultimate failure is a contest against others. They are taught to cheer winners and to hate losers. What, then? happens, when Americans lose. Their hatred becomes directed inward. Deprived of any sense of higher sense of justice, above that dispensed by the legal system or a higher sense of fairness, above that dispensed by referees in competitive sports or judges in other competitions, the actual word, which in Russian is spravedlivost, is altogether missing in English, Americans can't feel slighted. It is simply their fate to be losers, and it is their lot to curse their fate to themselves and quietly self-destruct. It doesn't occur to them to question how a successful country can be full up with losers because America, is the greatest country on earth. I don't know how many times I have found myself in the following situation. Somebody endlessly regales me with stories of personal trials and tribulations, expecting commiseration. But when I point out that the problem isn't personal, that it's your country that sucks, not you, and explain exactly how it doesn't stack up against others, that person recoils in horror and the conversation usually ends with well, why don't you just go back to Russia? My final and definitive answer is, of course, well, that's exactly what I've done, but thank you for the excellent suggestion. But most Americans never get the opportunity to even have such a conversation. Their conception of the rest of the world is formed by mass media, which flatters the US while denigrating the rest of the world, and by listening to immigrants, who are simultaneously under two kinds of pressure, the pressure to fit in, requiring optimism about America, and the pressure not to appear as losers in their own minds for having forsaken their homelands. This latter pressure sometimes results in grotesque self-abasement, for example, some Russian immigrants, racked with nostalgia, spend hundreds of hours on the internet seeking out negative news from Russia, then gleefully reporting them on social media. There is no point in Americans protesting. 
There is no sense in them protesting against the system because it is the system they know and love. To them, it is a perfectly good system that makes lots of rich people even richer. If they, personally, don't win, then that's their own fault or bad luck or whatever, but at least they can still dream about being rich and enjoy wealth vicariously. The few of them that might get an inkling that this isn't quite the way things should be simply start looking for other places elsewhere in the world where their chances would be better. The two questions I hear most often from those whose dislike of America is causing them to look for greener pastures are, where in the world should I move to? And where should I stash my money? The thought that, before they could make a life elsewhere, they would need to change themselves, and revise their priorities, and their outlook, is simply too painful. My inevitable conclusion is rather sad, not only is America unreformable and unredeemable, but so are the people in it. It is what it is until it won't be. Over the years, I have tried tackling the problem from every possible angle, starting with Soviet-style superior collapse preparedness, to organizing semi-autarchic self-sufficient communities, to making conscious, liberating choices on the use of technology, to simply sailing away from it all, but to no avail, apparently, none of what I proposed smelled enough of success. A lifetime of humble labor of love is of no interest to someone who just wants a car that goes real fast and gets shitty gas mileage. And that's what most Americans want, and if they can't get it, what they want to do is complain, not protest, since that would be silly. And that, I suppose, is exactly as it should be. This podcast was brought to you by BG Media. Download the BG Media app today or visit barglobal.net for more podcasts. Thank you.